to be here with the Fairfax County Master Gardeners. And today we have Cindy Metcalf, who will be giving you a presentation on the scented path. Over to you, Cindy. Okay. Well, thanks so much. And uh, so we're going to get started. And I'm going to be talking about um, fragrance in the garden. So, you know, I want to just kind of go over it at depth. So the, the value of scent in our lives is really impossible to measure or qualify, equally so in our gardens. Um, you know, these days it's so much cheaper and easier uh, just to duplicate some, uh, certain scents in a laboratory that our appreciation for natural fragrance uh, remains pretty intense and really is as indescribable as the fragrances themselves. You know, human response to fragrance sort of defies logic and can be both physical and emotional. You know, fragrance influences our mood, our thought, our imagination, our behavior. It stirs memories in a way that no other of our other five senses do. In fact, you know, our sense of smell has actually been referred to as liquid memory. And it's linked to the same area in our brain that controls mood and emotion. So some fragrances can lighten your mood. Others can stimulate your appetite. We don't like those too much, but <laughs> it happens. Um, and then others are just calming, you know, like lavender, um, things like that. Fragrance creates a unique uh, nuance in a garden, you know, an intimate environment. It can sort of evoke uh, a sense of mystery and charm. It can extend an unspoken hospitality and encourage the visitor to stay there longer than if just to go and, and look at the flowers and the physical uh, beauty. Uh, it does more than that. So to me, uh, a scent uh, in a garden is kind of like an invisible garden. You know, sometimes you're going out and you're shopping for a plant for a particular color or shape, purpose in your yard. But once it has a fragrance, that just makes that plant so much more, um, more than what it looks to be to me. You know, fragrance is teasing and taunting, um, complicated and elusive. So there's lots of, there's a function of scent when you think about the, the, the biological function of scent. And that is usually that the fragrance is there to aid in pollination by attracting bees or moths, butterflies, flies, gnats, bats, you know, all of those things. You know, they wanna be attracted to them so they can, they can spread its pollen everywhere. So supporting this thought, some scents are known to be strongest when the pollen is ripe and some flowers like primula lose their scent once it's pollinated, which I did not realize. Um, leaves and other parts of plants can be scented with compounds that are likely to do the opposite. Instead of bringing you know, people to them, it deters pests um, and, and people too. Lighter colored flowers like mauves, pinks, lavenders are often scented where the red, yellow, and orange counterparts are not. So to me, those really bright flowers are so uh, bright in colors that they you know, it seems like they don't need any scent. So in plant breeding, fragrance is a recessive trait, which I did not realize. And more often it is lost in the search of other desirable traits that sell plants. You know, we want bigger, we want showier, we want uh, dwarfs. Um, and so we kind of lose those, those scented parts. Um, so, and typically two heavy scented parent plants often produce scentless offspring. So many of our fragrance standbys like roses and lilies are you know, being bred now without any scent because they want all those other, the show, the color. Um, but there are a few that are coming into the trade like these three that have scent. And it's kind of unusual because you know, mostly people are looking for bigger, better, more color. The plants convey scent through essential oils, um, which are diffused. They can be all throughout the plant or they can just be in their petals, their leaves. 
the stems, the root, it's just not always in the blossom. And these essential oils are volatile and they evaporate really quickly and they spread their molecules into the surrounding air. So only when they are airborne are we able to smell them. Um, and this explains why a scent of a plant can kind of be fleeting. It can be intense, you know, right walk by, but then as you move further away, it's gone. I put this slide in here because, as I had told some of the early members, I'm really from New Orleans, and um, I had done this presentation before really on just scented plants, not, uh, and specifically probably non-natives, um, because in New Orleans, it's all about the scent. Um, you know, we have a lot of um, tropicals and uh, that really smell wonderful. And I love the night bloomers. I specifically love that hummingbird moth. Um, I have a lot of brumansias, some angel trumpet trees, and I do grow a lot of daturas, different varieties. And those moths are just magical to watch. They're so big. Um, and they have the largest proboscis, I think, of any moth. So if you have any kids, it's just, um, the kids are just fascinated by these moths. But a lot of plants, especially the night bloomers, are only strongly scented at night. And this is looking for those nocturnal pollinators. So bats and moths, things like that. And typically with the night blooming plants, they're usually very light in color. They're white or very pale, so they show up at night. So that's the hornworm um, uh, moth. And, you know, they eat our tomatoes too, but they are really a night pollinator. Um, and um, they're just really, to me, I think to have a few night bloomers in your yard are just lovely because in the summertime when it is so hot, even here, you know, it's nice to go out at night, sit in the garden, and some of these are fragrant. I've not been real successful with night blooming cirrus, but um, Brumansia's angel trumpets are night bloom. Well, they bloom during the day, but they only are scented at night. And they're just really lovely um, to look at, to smell, um, and to have a, you know, a relaxing glass of wine out there with your plants is, to me, just wonderful. So there are a lot of factors that affect scent. So um, temperature and humidity play a big role in how strong that fragrance is. You know, when it's hot, it tends to bring out the fragrance, whereas when it's cold, um, it suppresses the fragrance. So typically the scents, the plants are more noticeable, the, the smell, the fragrance, when the day warms up. But by the end of the day, they've kind of exhausted it and it's kind of, it's almost too much heat. Wind has a big effect because, you know, as the wind blows, those wisps of the flowers kind of perfume. It's very subtle and, and fleeting. Um, but then on a hot, still day, you know, you might, it might become overwhelming. I can think of like a privet or um, there are some flowering uh, shrubs that can be almost overwhelming. Um, wind tends to also lessen and die down at dust. So that makes those since sort of wave, you know, uh, stay and saturate the air. And overcast weather usually um, kind of can inhibit scent, whereas you need that sunlight and sunshine to, you know, to make those blossoms come open so they can emit their fragrance. But it does depend also on the number of blossoms and the age of the flowers. And even sometimes the, the soil, the nutrients in the soil how scented a plant will be. Of course, to me, I think the best way is to bring those cut flowers indoors because that really is a more um, guarded space. You know, it, it's enclosed. It's an, usually the interior of your home and it's not hot and dry. So you can really enjoy those scents. You know, they really last longer in your home. Um, I mean, of course, there are some uh, scents that might be too overpowering. There are people who uh, force paper whites, and sometimes to me, paper whites are a little overpowering in the house, but um, given how many you have, you know, you just don't have a whole bunch. Um, but I think really bringing flowers in, um, it's just a really wonderful thing to do, you know, just to have a few cut 
flowers in a vase by your bedside. Things that our mothers did that we tend to forget to do. So I wanna talk about um, defining and describing the actual fragrance. So it's really hard to describe all the different types of fragrances because I think um, as humans, we, you know, we have a hard time, um, you know, there's, we're all individuals. And so smells sometimes are kind of personal or subjective um, and it's hard to really describe them. We don't really have the vocabulary uh, to describe them. So some plants have scents that are so distinctive, they become kind of part of the vocabulary themselves, like carnations and gardenia, lily of the valley, rose and violets. Those are kind of all used to describe fragrance of other plants. And then some plants, of course, evoke uh, food uh, imagery. So like um, basic food, food flavors like chocolate and vanilla or lemon uh, or fruit things like strawberry, plum, or pineapple. And that's because our sense of smell is so closely related to our sense of taste. You know, if you lose your sense of taste, or I'm sorry, if you lose your sense of smell, which people did with COVID, it is really hard to have any taste to your food. So it kind of becomes harder to define those, those scents if it's not related to food. So back in 1977, there was a British horticulturist. His name was Roy Genders. And he sort of isolated and classified 10 uh, flower fragrances and four leaf aromas. Um, and those were based on the chemicals that dominate all their essential oils. And this kind of, he, this was his attempt to sort of describe what those scents actually were. So the, the plants in the rose group, um, has an alcohol called uh, gerinol, which I, I hope I'm not misspelling some of, or mispronouncing some of these, but this gerinol is in the leaves and the flowers. And it is the old rose fragrance, like the true altar rose uh, that was harvested from damask roses. The violet group, the violet group has a, an um, ionomy, and that is the main component in that uh, plants oils and as it it kind of changes as it at ages initially it was like a kind of a very fresh cucumber or woodland um, kind of comes from a cucumber to a woodland to a mossy smell and these are very you know distinct for him to try to do this it's pretty interesting um, that he went through all of this the flowers in the aromatic aromatic group are very spicy smelling so that's like almond vanilla cinnamon um, or things that are clove, kind of clove scented. So plants like heliotrope or witch hazel, wisteria, carnations, stock, those are all in that arom aromatic group, which is probably my favorite group. Um, lemon, uh, that group is got citral in it. And that is where our, like our magnolias, the verbena or evening primrose, they have kind of a little lemony fragrance to it. Um, the heavy group, which is uh, dominated by very strong scents, um, paper whites come into this group and um, it has a, a, a chemical called endonol. And that is why some people can, can take a paper white and then some people just really cannot um, be in the same room with a paper white or even like oriental lilies. Um, sometimes they're very, very strong. The fruit scented ones, of course, those, um, you know, those are like a fruit scented, not lemon, but like apple and banana and orange and plum scents. And then there's the honey group, which is uh, flowers with really delicate, um, sweet smells, like it smells kind of like honeysuckle or bitalia. Um The other one that in, in the indeloid, um, those are typically flowers from Southeast, a Southeast Asia. Asia. I'm sorry, and South America, and they are the really stinky ones that um, kind of smell like animal decom you know, decomposition or uh, rotten meat. You know, I think of the voodoo plant. One time I was in Australia and they had this voodoo plant that was blooming. I guess it blooms only every, I don't know, 20 years or something. And, um, and they're huge. The, the bloom is this giant putrid bloom. <laughs> But it was such a big deal. Everybody had to go. And I, I went because I thought I'll probably never see another one. But obviously that would not be a, um, 
a flower that you'd have probably in your garden. Um, but this was in a, in, um, this was in a, uh, a nurse, not a nursery, but in a botanical garden. Then you have animal scented ones. And that typically is something that starts out, it kind of smells fruity or musky, but it has some fatty acid in it. And I, he, and I didn't find out what that was, but um, one of my sources said that a flower like in this group may give off a scent of vanilla when it's fresh, but it, then it ends up smelling like a tomcat. Oh, I thought that was pretty weird. And then the last group, the amyoid, those are groups um, that have like the pyracantha has, privet, and sometimes it kind of has a fishy brine or an ammonia smell to their um, flowers. And I really don't like, um, you know, I really have a real issue with some privets. I've, I've been in a nursery before where they were all blooming and I really felt sort of ill. But of course, if you're going to the garden, uh, the garden center to go and pick out some flowers or shrubs or trees, um, the best way to do that is to have this little uh, cheater list, I call it. And, you know, Latin, the Latin suffix tells a lot about a flower. So on the name tag, you know, you can look at it and you can see all of these Latin suffixes and it will tell you, you know, what it's going to sort of smell like, whether it's, you know, it smells like a licorice or it's very fragrant or if it's stinky um, or if it's bitter. Um, so I think when you go to the nursery, you know, it, the best thing to do is to make sure and smell everything. And I like to go in the spring when it's blooming so that I know what I'm getting. Um, but then also like, you know, whenever spring hits and you're all there trying to choose your annuals, you know, some annuals are fragrant, some are not. You just need to smell and see. Um, so this is just a quick little thing. And I am going to share my PowerPoint. So if anybody... Um, all my notes are in the PowerPoint, so if you want to go back and, and pick up a slide or remember something that I mentioned, please do. So let's get into the natives. So one of my favorites, since I've lived here, I've already put one of these trees in my landscape. Um, this is our native fringe tree, uh, sometimes called the Gracie uh, Graybeard. Uh, it's known for its really beautiful kind of fleecy um, white blossoms. Um, it's to me, it was really hard for me to tell what it smells like. I like to think of it as smelling and it's not in that group. Um, but to me, it smells like a really beautiful lipstick, like, like a Lancome or a Estee Lauder lipstick. I don't know how to explain it other than that. It, that's just what it smells like to me. They can go rather tall, um, and pretty wide and it's a multiple trunk tree. It's a host tree for a lot of different sphinx moth, moths, um, the thing that kind of got me when I, I had gone to a talk um, by, and I'm trying to think what his name, he, he wrote The Living Landscape with um, Daniel Dark. I'm trying to think he's out of uh, Connecticut, but it was one of the trees that provided food for 75 plus species of birds. And that was just really important to me. I, I, I've always had bird feeders and I love to feed the birds. And so giving that sort of, um, you know, that was just a plus for me for this tree. Now, you have to be careful with it. Um, um, I know that I'm in the ex fall. Excuse oh, go me. Go ahead. Excuse me, that the living landscape. Yes. Uh, it's it's, by, Dark it's and, by Rick uh, Dark and Doug Talame. Doug Talame, yes. And this, uh, there are probably <clears throat> other versions. This is the illustrated version. Mm -hmm. So when I was in New Orleans, I was president of the Master Gardeners and we had Doug Talame. So I'm so sorry, I forgot his name. Him and Rick Dark come and do a presentation for us. And there are a lot of um, wonderful videos, videos out there. And it's a, it's a wonderful book to read. And he's got a list of all the trees um, that are um, good for birds. And there's a wonderful um, video where one of his graduate students did a study on chickadees. And it really talks about, you know, how important it is for us to not plant non-native trees that if we want our birds um, to flourish, we're going to need to have um, some host, or, you know, something that's providing caterpillars to feed their young and also provide uh, shelter for them. 
So this was one of the trees that, I mean, he loves maples and oaks and things, but this was another tree that he mentioned. And I just really love this tree. It has really beautiful fall color, but I do know that it has a problem with dry conditions because I'm in the Great Falls Garden Club. I just recently joined that and they had planted a few out in front of the library. And I guess it was beyond the watering scope. And I think they all died. Um, so they don't like, you know, tremendous drought. And of course, when you're in the South, um, you know, you always think of magnolias. And um, so our native Sweet Bay Magnolia is a wonderful, wonderful tree. I've got three in my backyard. I put all these other ones in just because I think there are so many other ones. Um, some are, um, you know, some are a little bit more fragrant than others. And they've got so many, you know, new varieties. I know that with the Southern Magnolia, they've got a new one called Little Jim and Teddy Bear that is, is really, they're really lovely trees. They're not so huge and they're a little bit uh, better to put in a city landscape. Um, but I think all of you know magnolias, all the different colors and types. Um, but I, when I was doing this class back while well, when I was doing this presentation, I did not know, but I found out that magnolias are supposed to be the earliest known flowering plant, which I had no idea. So they, ex they existed before bees and they rely on beetles for pollination. So that instead of nectar, the flower produces pollen for the beetles. And uh, that was really interesting that um, I had no idea that it was such an old plant. And that also that the magnolia flowers are, all, are actually composed of what they call tepals. And that's a combination of sepals and petals. So they're similar in size and shapes, like a water lily. And I mean, I just didn't know that they were that old of a plant. Um, and then I put this slide in to, just to tell the difference between the sweet bay, you know, and a Southern Magnolia, but it's very simple. Um, you know, size, of the size, the leaf shape, um, the flower looks similar, but not the same. And of course the seed pods are very different, but I, I just put this in, but you know, we see both of these um, throughout our landscapes. I prefer the Sweet Bay only because I think, of, um, you know, the Southern Magnolia just gets so big so t some sometimes, and um, I don't know, the pods are everywhere sometimes. <laughs> so, so the next one I'm going to talk about is Serviceberry, another one of these um, trees that are wonderful. They're wonderful spring um, blooms with scent and. Um, it is a member of the rose family, so you do have to kind of watch it. It's going to have some of the diseases um, as roses do. Also, um, if you plant it near an eastern red Caesar, they share the same rust disease, so you need to make sure you don't plant it near any of those. Um, sometimes it's called down, downy service berry. There's a few native ones, the Allegheny um, service berry and the Canadian, serv Canadian service berry. They... Um, you know, they all have kind of different um, different heights and widths. Um, they do produce summer, I mean, I'm sorry, they do produce suckers. They are deer resistant. Um, and I just, I think it's just, they have a beautiful sort of multi-trunk um, look to it sometimes. Um, the berries are really nice. The fruit will ripen, it turns blue um, and the birds love that. So it's just a wonderful tree to put into your yard. Native plums, I, you know, I really don't see many fruit trees around. Um, you know, I see a few native um, quinces um, and, um, but these came up in the list. I took all these from the Plant Nova Natives uh, list that I found online. And uh, I think that we do miss out and not plant some of these fruiting trees. I know this is not a fruit that you would go and pick and probably eat it right off the tree. They're, it's a little astringent, but you could make it into jam. Um, and it is still food for animals in our, in our landscape. Um, it's really pretty drought tolerant. Um, it's a good tree. You can cut it, make it into a hedge. It does sucker and there are thorns, but it, it really has, um, you know, beautiful fall color. And it has, um, you know, all, it attracts all the bees um, with all those flowers. Very sweet smelling. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about shrubs. This is one of my favorite. I've, I've got a few of these in my yard. I love the button bush. Um, I think because it just, it's such an unusual flower with those little pin cushions, 
has a really nice sweet smell. Um, you know, the, the moths, I'm sorry, the butterflies love it, the sphinx moths love it, bees, insects love it, the fruit loves those little red fruits that come on in the fall. It's also deer resistant. So that's always a plus here. I mean, I have deer that walk through my yard and eat my peonies and my dahlias and everything else. Um, has a really nice sort of vanilla uh, spice sort of smell. Um, and you can plant it in mass and make it into sort of a, you know, a, a break between, you know, in your property. Another one that I really think is nice too is the Sweet Spire. Um, it's native. It has those sort of bowy arms that just kind of float over with their um, their blooms and the, the bees just love it um, and other pollinators too. It's, it's really a full sun plant. I know it can take some shade, but if you put it too much in the shade, of course, you're not going to have the blooms that you would normally have. And it does it, it really needs the full sun to have that sort of red uh, fall color. They can get pretty big, those, those arms, those, those, um, the, the branches that come out, they can get about eight feet long. I mean, I think it's really pretty. Um, it is also um, very deer resistant. So that's another plus. And then witch hazel, which I think we all still love witch hazel. It's sort of a, it's supposed to be a shrub, but sometimes I've seen them where they look more like a tree. They get pretty big. Um, and um, it loves moist soils. It can, you know, live in woodlands, um, likes acid soils, doesn't flower very much if you have it in the shade. And they have these wonderful little spidery uh, flowers um, and they're very fragrant. So, and of course they, as their leaves drop, they're, you're, they're more noticeable. Um, there are um, different kinds of witch hazels, of course, non-natives. And um, to me, I know some of them do smell, but some of them are not very smell, not very scented because they've crossed them like these intermediaries, they crossed them. So they really want the largest flowers. They want that big bloom, but then they lose the scent. And I think the scent is really important, especially when you're and just walking by, you could smell it. it. Has, as you can see, it has really pretty um, fall color. That yellow, to me, they sort of smell like freesias. Um, that's my. I mean, it has kind of a spicy scent. It's not deer resistant. And I think the other thing that was kind of funny when I was looking up this plant was that it's got its name from um, divining rods. Apparently, uh, in witchcraft, they used to use the the branches of this to, uh, I guess, the, whatever they're looking for, water or whatever they were looking for. But I had no idea that it was, you know, really a witch sort of thing about it. And spice bushes, I think they're another beautiful bush to put in your landscape. Um, they have kind of, it has kind of an all spicy smell. In fact, I think back in when the first Europeans came, we didn't have, they didn't have all spice. They used this, they ground up the the dupes, I don't know if they have, if you say it like that, dupes, is that how you say the dupes, the fruit? Is it dupes? It's droops. Oh, droops, got that R in there. So apparently they used to use it as a substitute for allspice. Um, so it has kind of a lemony smell. Um, it's very deer resistant. It love, you know, birds and, and native bees and pollinators love it. Um, it is the host plant for the spice bush butterfly. and the caterpillar is really unique with those little eyeballs. They're so cute. Um, and I didn't realize, but I, when I was looking this up too, it said that the Cherokee and the Chippewa Indians used to use it to um, disguise the flavor of meat. So it was kind of like a, instead of a curry taste, you know, they used this sort of all, uh, allspice taste to, um, to uh, kind of camouflage um, the taste of meat that was a little on the old side. Then I added these because I just, I, I think that we, we don't grow enough of the, I love the Carolina allspice. I just really love that. It's, it smells so wonderful. Um, to me, it kind of smells like strawberries, but some other people think it smells like something else. Um, I've got one in my yard and it, it's just really a lovely, um, a lovely shrub. Um, they used to apparently use the roots and the bark um, to grind up and it sort of is like cinnamon, which I did not realize. 
although the plant to me doesn't smell anything like cinnamon and I haven't tried it. Um, there is a variety of this Carolina allspice called, um, it's the, the, the other part of it is Athens. It's a green flowered variety and it smells like Granny Smith apples. So I thought that was kind of unique. Um, although the, you can grind up the roots and the bark and the leaves, um, the seeds apparently are very toxic. And in researching this, I read that the Cherokee Indians used to use those seeds to poison wolves. So I guess they put it and put the seeds in meat and then the wolves would eat it. And I guess that's how they got rid of some of the wolves around their, their, um, their, home, their homes. Um, the sweet shrub is another one. It's lovely. Sometimes it's called summer sweet or sweet pepper bush. Um, it's another native uh, deciduous shrub and it likes moist um, areas. It has a very spicy uh, fragrance and there's some that are really beautiful. There's like this one called Spink Spot, Pink Spires and Rosea, but there is a native form too. And there is even a dwarf form that's only to three feet. Um, and then the last one down below, they all, to me, the last two sort of look similar. The Virginia Willow or Sweet Spire, it's, uh, it's really beautiful too. It has blunt, wonderful uh, fall color. Um, most of these, or at least this one, will, uh, it does have suckers. Um, so you do have to kind of watch that. They all will attract butterflies and birds and other pollinators. And these you see, the rhododendron, well, commonly just native azaleas, you see those in our woodlands. I live in Oakton, between Oakton and Reston, and by difficult run. And in the springtime, you see these blooming, you know, throughout the, the forest, um, right at the roadside. They're really beautiful, um, very, very, very sweetly scented. They can get really tall. You know, I can, I've seen them six feet. I've seen them like 10 feet. Um, they're not deer resistant. But um, they're really nice to have in your yard, but they are deciduous, uh, of course, so they're going to lose their leaves. But they really are just a sweet, sweet smell. Wonderful to put it by a back door um, or in your landscape um, that you can smell as you, you know, as you walk through your yard. Even hummingbirds like this, this plant or this shrub. And then I, you know, uh, with the plant novas, um, they listed a few vines and I think we all love to look at wisterias, but I think wisterias can just really go crazy and rampant. And um, so our American wisteria is still pretty twiny and can really take over an area. You have to be really careful. Um, but it is a beautiful plant and it has a lovely scent to it. To me, it sort of smells like grape bubble gum. The bees love it. Um, so that's another thing you have to be a little concerned about. If you plant it near a patio, you're going to have bees flying around. Um, there are other, you know, there's a Chinese and there's a Japanese uh, wisteria, but all of them are pretty, in, to me, pretty invasive. So you just need to really watch them and you'd have to have a, you know, some structure for them to grow on. Um, I like looking at them from a distance. <laughs> I'm not real a big fan of them having in my, uh, in my yard. And then vines, you know, um, uh, Clematis, the, the Virginia. The, those are everywhere in the spring. They're so beautiful. Sometimes they're called Virginia's Bower or Old Man's Beard or Devil's Darning Needles. I think, I just love how some people come up with these very uh, unusual names. But, you know, it's really a beautiful, it just kind of flows over the, whatever's in the landscape. It has these beautiful little hairy um, seed pods. Um, and it is somewhat deer resistant, but, you know, the bees love it. The butterflies love it. Hummingbirds love it. Um, it's very, very sweet. Um, and you can see it. It's just, you know, it's just out there growing everywhere. And then, of course, we all know the passion flower, the maypop. Those are growing around. You see them. Um, they're for the, that is the Gulf uh, flitterary uh, butterfly, which are very small. They're not very big. They're only about an inch tall. And then I have never seen this zebra heliconian. But um, that's also a host plant for that. And, um, you know, they're very nice too. I don't think that they have the, the sweetest scent to me when I've uh, smelled the flowers, but they are very lovely to look at and uh, they are a host plant. So you need to provide these host plants in order for you to, to bring your, the nature into your yard.
And then let's just talk briefly about perennials. There was a very long list of perennials on the Plant Nova's website, but a lot of them were not very showy. And I, I must admit, I do, I really want it to still have some flowers um, and for them to be somewhat showy. Um, so of course you look at, you know, uh, garden fox, and that to me is kind of the backbone of, you know, perennial borders and they love full sun. They're, they're loved by hummingbirds, butterflies, you know, everyone loves them and they, they basically bloom spring through summer. I'm sorry, spring through fall. Um, the bone set I was not really um, knowledgeable about. I've never grown bone set. So I don't know if any of you have. Um, it's very, very sweet smelling. It attracts bees and all kinds of butterflies. And of course, with phlox and this bone set, you can, they're wonderful cut flowers. They are pretty, they have a pretty long life once you put them into the house with a, in a vase. Virginia iris is very lovely. Um, you know, of course it would tolerate a, a wet condition, uh, wet locations, has a very slight sweet scent, not overpowering. And of course our Virginia bluebells, they have a lovely little slight scent too. And, um, you know, hummingbirds and bees love those flowers. And of course, all of these are deer resistant, which I think in our landscapes, we have to be cautious about. Couple more perennials, um, you know, the swamp milkweed and um, common milkweed, which we grow here. Um, you know, you want the butterflies to come to your landscape and you have to provide um, not just food, but a place for them to raise their young. So, you know, planting these host plants um, really help, you know, the monarchs um, proliferate and, and, and grow in numbers. So um, you see the, the swamp milkweed, um, that to me will tolerate a little bit more wetter conditions, but common milkweed, you see that just kind of growing everywhere, or at least like to me, where I live, it just seems to be growing everywhere and it can get quite large, um, but it's very important to grow these flowers. I think if you, you know, you can see the monarchs around and, um, and they are a host plant, so then they develop their, their, their uh, chrysalises stay there and it's a wonderful plant, it's a wonderful plant. So going back to, um, I, you know, I think about, uh, I know about Roy Genders, who was the one that was coming up with all these fragrances, but I think, you know, this is not really in the native group, but um, I do think it's really important when you have a garden to have a sort of scratch and sniff area of your garden, because I, I don't know about you, but if I'm walking through a garden and I see a rosemary plant or a lavender plant, I cannot resist, you know, taking my hand and running up that branch and then bringing it to my face to smell it. You know, of course, if it's, it's rosemary, I would let that, that what well, they call it the herb of remembrance. I need all the remembrance I can get. So of course I do smell that every time I go by it. Um, but I think that's the, you know, that's an irresistible part of a garden that it has some sort of sense, something that, that draws you into it. So I didn't realize, but he's also Roy, you know, separated out the fragrant foliage groups too. So mint, of course, is pretty obvious. You know, you've got um, scented geraniums and things like that. That's in that mint group. And of course, all the mints. The camphor eucalyptus group is where most of the herbs are in. That's like cat mint, cat mint um, chamomile, lavender, rosemary, sage. Um, and then, uh, so that Carolina allspice uh, bush that I talked about earlier, that's in this group. The sulfur group is where the plants are like onions and garlic and watercress. And then turpentine, um, although he's got it listed in the camper eucalyptus, really they talk about that uh, rosemary is the main plant in the turpentine group. So, you know, I just think it's really not, you, you need to have some of these scented geraniums and, and rosemary and thyme so that you can brush by them or just reach out and touch them and smell them. Um, even sometimes after you've had a really uh, strong rain, you know, you can smell um, these scented uh, plants in your yard. And um, I think it's just really important. Sometimes you do have to actually tear the plant, you know, it needs to be bruised, walked on, or brushed against to for it to emit its essential oils. But I just think that that's one thing you need to really put in your garden because not everybody wants, um, 
you know, the sweet smelling things. There, it's nice to have something that has more of a, um, you know, a more earthy smell, more, um, you know, more just not, not very sweet. I think it's just another layer, you know, to the garden. So that's one thing I, I really wish that everybody, I mean, I'm, I have a lot of, um, I worked at a botanical gardens on Kauai many, many years ago, almost 30 years ago. And when I left, I brought a bunch of different gingers. So I have all kinds of gingers like Kahili ginger and white butterfly, yellow fly butterfly ginger. I have probably seven different types of brumensias. I have, like I have a lot of plumerias. I have a lot of crinums or graveyard lilies, what I call graveyard lilies, um, that I keep outside until like last week. And then they all come inside and live in my basement for a, a couple of months, well, three months. Um, I just feel like if, if the plant needs something more than just a bloom, I think it has to have a scent. It needs something, um, some other connection to me. Um, I mean, I do love looking at pretty flowers and things like that, but I think at least with me, you know, um, I have a couple of viburnums that I have next to my backyard that I walk through my gate, I can smell them. Um, I just think it's really important to have this scent in your garden. I think it brings another whole dimension. Um, and I think it is very memory um, related. You know, if I am outside and I'm next to my angel trumpets, it kind of pushes me, transports me back to living on Kauai. I mean, it's just, it, it gives you that memory that you would not have um, just if it was a pretty flower. You're not going to, to me, I don't think if you see a bunch of flowers and they're going to transport you to some other time, but maybe tulips, I guess, tulips and maybe dahlias. But um, I think it's really important to have this scent quotient. So if you want to learn more about natives, this Plant Nova, Na Plant Nova Natives website has everything you need to know about it. It has a long list um, of everything that you can grow in your yard. And I know that when you go to some of the nurseries, they have all those plants separated, or at least Maryfield does. And then as Ian's, for some of you that may have joined later, you know, we have been having um, a lot of, because of COVID, we started to have a lot of our plant clinics online and you could just join. Um, the plant clinics have stopped, but you can still go and listen to all those plant clinics. Um, and you can just go to fairfaxgardening.org or you can go to the VCE Fairfax YouTube channel and all of those, um, all of those videos are still there. So if you want to start getting ready for next year for your veggie garden or something, you know, you can go in and search those YouTubes and they're all available for you. It's a great resource. So that's just the other.